my name is Lily Jia. I'm a senior researcher at uh, engineering department at the University of Cambridge. So my research focuses on incentivizing behavior changes towards the health and sustainability. Okay. I'm Jean Adams. I work in the Centre for Diet and Activity Research, which is part of the MRC Epidemiology Unit. And my work focuses on dietary public health. I'm interested in how we can change environments to help people eat better. And I'm Marie-Louise Tissonson and I work in the Department of Archaeology and doing my work I've been excavating food from thousands of years old and also work in heritage which where we're interested in the important food has a part of identity. So in terms of the question of processing or preserving food it's interesting to look back in time because it's something which was needed already very early. If you cannot preserve your food you either have to use it immediately, like big feast. Mm -hmm. If you slaughter an animal, you bring everyone together to eat it because it has to be eaten very quickly. Or you have to find ways of, of keeping it. And there, uh, cheese is very interesting because we have it very early. So we know we have cheese, for example, in Poland more than 7,000 years ago. And that's also a time when people, in, people didn't have lactose tolerance. So they could not drink milk. Mm -hmm. So the milk was a product which could not be used unless one turned it into something else. And at the same time, it's also a project which don't last very well. So we have to see that inventiveness around food mm -hmm. and developing them into product which can last. And that, of course, has various kind of consequences. The things I can see is consequences in terms of specialism, in terms of trade object, you can exchange it, you can keep it. That, so you get a different kind of temporality in people's life. Rather than food being produced and eaten. Uh -huh. And presumably something that allows also this issue of choice, that if I can trade food, then I can yeah. have food that I haven't necessarily yeah. grown locally. And you can create different kind of recipes for it. Mm -hmm. So if you drink milk straight, that is one thing. If you turn milk into different kind of like butter and yogurt and cheese, then you could really expand on the variation. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there must be issues of this, um, different types of food, helping people establish identity and driving culture. Yeah. But the fact that there are, is huge variety in food uh, now, but also historically, allows people to kind of identify that I'm in this particular group who yeah. eats this particular sort yeah. of food. In that sense, it's quite interesting in England how many of other cheeses have a name after a region, uh -huh. like well, yeah. Leicester or something like yeah. that. Uh, that. There are recipes for how to do it, how to bring out a particular taste, which are based around producers in a particular region and then at some point brand it or market it and control it, mm. or camembert and yeah, things like okay. that. In a way that m milk, as an unprocessed food, is just milk. Yeah. But it doesn't have any um, yeah. value associated with it, like, yeah. like Not those like locality. Value. Yeah. So has, has the technology of making che cheese has changed over the years? Um, it, it has in, in, cert in different ways. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the very early cheeses were probably more like cottage cheese. Mm -hmm. and so it's learning how to to make to make cheeses of greater stability or longer lasting. Mm -hmm. That is a longer process. Uh, but otherwise, in some way, it's not that change. It's quite interesting. Mm -hmm. There's something which reads the recipe relative early and stay like that. Mm -hmm. And there are other things which continue changing. Mm -hmm. And it's also then where does industrialization come in? Like sausages is probably something which developed quite early yeah. mm -hmm. and also very regional. Yeah, I think it also brings in another evolution of human needs <laughs> 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 by the availability. And uh, so as uh, sugar is more and more available and together with many food, like uh, more vegetables, uh, like tomatoes and, yeah. uh, and the green leaves, vegetables and become more and more available. And our diet is also richer is also following the industrialization process and more food is processed as well. So before probably only a few people develop some technologies 
to industrialize the food production process. But as more food is available and they can manufacture more and then a lot of people have the access to this food as well. Mm -hmm. So that is the, the one side of the story. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually uh, the proce processing food makes uh, it more accessible to a broader uh, uh, group of people. And on the other hand, uh, yeah. just pick up Jane's point about the health element. So think about uh, at the very beginning, I mean, like uh, when they started like uh, more than 100 years ago, but what is the need of uh, food? Mm -hmm. It's about uh, get, uh, get the enough energy, right? People haven't thought much about, uh, about uh, balanced diet and health and probably taste was there, mm -hmm. but uh, cannot be rank ranked very high because there are not uh, that many available food, right? And uh, gradually, as more and more foods are available and people start to need more, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and that uh, shifts uh, the needs for food. And until now, we don't worry, we, we no longer worry about uh, energy, mm -hmm. and now we worry about got too much too energy, too much, yeah. right? And how we are going to get the taste that we need, at the same time, we don't exceed the amount of energy required mm -hmm. by our body. Right? So there is an evolution of that. But industrialization helps us get enough energy because it, make, it made the food cheaper and also it provides a broader variety of food. The history of food has so far mainly been about people living in areas where they can access food relatively mm -hmm. easy. So the interesting thing is whether we can do things with food so that we can expand where we are. Mm -hmm. And going into the Antarctic or going the long distance over the Atlantic mm -hmm. or when we want to go into space, sure. then we need to be able to process food in such a way it can travel with us. Mm -hmm. in a way with relative easy, not having a big, not big freezer a uh, yeah. cow or yeah. things like that. Uh, and there uh, the processing come in to make it doable and to make it packable. I mean, it, I guess it facilitates these endeavours, right? But people yeah. were travelling across the sea long before tinned food. Yeah. It's just that somehow it makes it easier for us to consider that. Yes, so you have people t uh, in terms of the sea, but then you have fish as a possible source. Mm -hmm. So your problem with early sailors is that they often get scurvy because mm -hmm. it only had one uh -huh. food source. So there you get into issue of health. Mm -hmm. So adding to what you can bring with you matter in terms of health. And then the other thing is if we start, to, if we want to go to the moon, we have to bring the food yes. with us. Yes. Or if you, if you want to go to Antarctica, you need to bring a large amount of your food with you or you get very dependent on very few sources. Mm -hmm. And we have problem in the Arctic. Some of the Arctic uh, uh, expedition only lived of uh, like ice uh, polar bears mm -hmm. and got sick. Yes. So there, there, there was a health issue about not having uh, or being too dependent on a very few sources. And in terms of polar bear, I think they at the liver and it's not yeah, so as dangerous. Mm. So that's yeah. what, yeah, by eating too much of a food that we're not adapted yeah. to, mm. to consume. Yeah. So when we then look at, and the other, so we have the expeditions into the unknown mm -hmm. area with very, with very few natural food resources, which become enabled by us processing food. Yeah, yeah. Although when I look at um, those tins of food from more than a hundred years ago, all I can think of is how low tech it is. But mm. if I were going to go on a, a, a trip into the unknown and it was going to be a, a cold, harsh environment, I wouldn't be taking tins of food. That just seems such a, a strange thing to do. It takes up a lot of space. It's heavy. So what would you take? Well, you would take dehydrated food, right? Like the sort of food you would take to go to the moon. Yes. So that it's very interesting because that probably both talks to technology and taste. Mm. So for example, dry, uh, dry meat was used very much by American Indians, mm -hmm. but that was not a recipe which was taken up. But, uh, but the use of fat with meat is a recipe which has been adapted. Uh -huh. So it, it is quite interesting what, 
ways of pro natural, uh, long-standing traditional way of uh, processing we, we, yeah. we took on when we sort of got, got into exploring. So they had a, I think it was sort of those Victorian gentlemen who didn't care about what they were eating as long time as they were exploring the yeah, world. So yeah. it looked rather boring and, and limited. Yeah, and they would have had porters or sledges or dogs or whatever to, to carry that food. No, right. They also had to carry it themselves, actually. Yeah. So that, uh, it's a very, now we don't have, I'm sure there exists the menu a book for things like Scott's travel to Antarctica, <laughs> but uh, their photograph where they sit and have big meals around special times. When they but when they're out on the actual expedition, the food, the menu must have been very restricted, yeah. because it has to give them energy. Mm -hmm. It has to be as easy to transport as possible, and you have to eat it as it easily. Has to be easy to prepare as to well. To prepare yeah, and eat, yeah. yeah, yeah. So the extremes sort of challenge our technology quite a lot.